transmission that Jan White. Uh, Jan, I cannot hear you. I'll tell you what, why don't I switch over to my cell phone if you give me a minute, okay? Okay. Looks like we've got um, Mike joining us as well with Angie, so that'll be good. And we do have some, some guests this morning. We've got Tim Hunt, Highway Superintendent. Tim, who, which town are you Highway Superintendent with? I'm Lewis County. Oh, yes, right. You're the new Lewis County Highway Superintendent. The new Lewis Hi, County welcome, County. Tim. So hello, everyone. Welcome. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. We've got Norm Paradise from the town of Worth, Councilman. We've got Tim Kelly from Amboy. Welcome, Tim. Thank you. And Harlan, who can't get enough of us, I thought he, he was done, but he must have missed all of our smiling faces. So, hi, Harlan. Hello, how are you? Good morning. <laughs> Good morning. Well, it's easy sitting from the from the comfort of your own home watching a meeting. This is this is fine. <laughs> <laughs> they rolled it out just for a retirement gift for you. I don't know. It's been too been too soon. It, it doesn't feel like retirement yet. About six months and it'll kick in. <laughs> We've got Lee joining us from, I think, I don't think that's a, just a background. I think that's his real location, sunny Florida. <laughs> that's it, Sarasota. Nice. Rub it in. <laughs> Still waiting for Jan to reconnect. So hopefully his cell phone will at least work. We've got some staff too. We've got Matt and Carla, Jean and Jen, Felicia, and of course Gwen, who's always here. Lee, what's the temperature in Florida this morning? Uh, right now, 68. Nice. <laughs> Going to go to about 76 by the afternoon. Hello. Someone please mute that man. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Jan. Can you hear us now? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yep. You're a little bit better. Yep. Good. 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 Well, I'm running out of uh, a broadband here, or bandwidth. The only thing I could tell you is that I am. Uh, Lately, I've been feeling that the uh, frontier is a little bit like the, uh, how can I say this, uh, the internet Nazis. No internet for you. <laughs> but we're, we're working through it. The only thing I could tell you is they, they spent a lot of money sending up engineers and crews. Uh, last week, I had uh, a bucket truck and five service trucks up here for them to tell me that all of my poles across the... Uh, Telephone poles across the meadow were over 400 feet apart, which I didn't really know what that meant. But uh, they had to send up more engineers to determine what the, the tensile strength of a cable is on a, on a wire because they didn't want the poles to fall over. So we're getting closer, but hopefully uh, by the next meeting, we will have uh, another, ex another uh, point of uh, contact for broadband here. So we're getting closer. You know, should we get everybody's ready? We might as well get started here, Katie. Yep, we've got everybody now. I think Angie, uh, is, is Mike with you? Yeah. No, oh. I haven't seen Uncle Mike yet this morning, surprisingly. Okay, but we've got six to seven. So yep, we can go ahead and start. All right, we'll get started. Again, welcome. Good morning uh, to the uh, January 25th, 2021, our first uh, uh, monthly virtual Tug Hill Commission meeting for uh, 2021. I appreciate everyone uh, tuning in, if you will. In your packets or in your emails that you received from Katie, uh, you have a proposed agenda for today's meeting. Uh, hopefully everyone had an opportunity to review that. Uh, I'll need a motion to accept uh, the uh, proposed agenda for today's meeting. Well moved. Uh, anybody? Uh, okay, do I have a second? Second. All right, Katie, you're going to have to help me because I can't see anybody, but uh, 
<laughs> I'm going to call that Tom and Leona, although Bill and Tom are kind of tied for emotion. I beat you this time, Bill. <laughs> there That's you go. All, all, those in yeah. all those in favor? Aye. All those opposed? Anybody abstain? Thank you. Uh, also, in the same email from Katie, you received uh, our proposed uh, monthly minutes from our December 14th meeting, uh, the last uh, meeting for 2020. And I hope again everyone had the opportunity to review those those minutes. Um, do I uh, have a motion to accept those uh, minutes as proposed? I will make the motion, Leona. Second. Do I have a second? No second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed. Anybody abstain? Good, thank you. We'll move right into the chairman's report. Uh, as part of uh, Governor Cuomo's initiative on uh, mobilizing state agency in, uh, in support of the uh, COVID-19 vaccination program, really the, the goal here is that uh, hoping for sometime later in 2021, we'll attain something that might look like herd immunity uh, I'm very happy that the Tug Hill Commission was called to duty as part of this initiative. I want to thank Katie. I want to thank Angie. I want to thank Elena uh, for giving their time to help out at the Regional Vaccination Center in Potsdam to really support this vaccination you. program. And I think, uh, Katie, once we get to the executive uh, director's report, if you have any questions on how you've been filling your days with uh, in Potsdam, uh, you can share it at that time. On uh, January 19th, last Tuesday, uh, we had heard that the governor's office was going to release its proposed 2021-2022 uh, proposed fiscal budget. We thought it was going to be released about 1130 in the morning. For uh, those of us that are very anxious to see what it looked like, it was never released until midnight on the 20th. Uh, at this time, I'm, I'm pretty happy to announce the Tug Hill Commission is funded, at least through the governor's proposed budget, at the same levels as last year. You know, this is definitely good news, but as all of you have been around the block a few times, you know that this is a, we have a ways to go before we get to some type of a, uh, a vote, a ratification through the Assembly and the Senate uh, sometime, hopefully before March 31st, 2021. And kind of doing a, a deep dive on the budget, it, it looks like the operational budgets look very similar to what they look like last year. If you look at the, across the enterprise in its entirety, but it was pretty clear that the governor has a goal for the uh, Fed to, uh, to reimburse the states for expenses and revenue shortfalls that uh, were due to COVID-19. That question is going to be how much. Um, how much it will really dictate if the state is going to have to look for additional revenue sources, such as marijuana, uh, hunting licenses for increases in hunting licenses. I, I also saw that they're looking at giving and making uh, a crossbow licenses available for 12 and 13 year, year olds, which scares me a little bit because I have a a brother-in-law who's 65 years old, and I, and it scares me to death to think he's going to go up a tree with one of those things <laughs> at 65 years old. But uh, that is definitely they're looking for additional revenue from hunting licenses. And the last big item is the possibility of a millionaire's tax here in New York State. Or we might be able to really have to realize that there'll be some additional operational cuts. So I think what we got to do is we got to stay tuned as the Biden administration moves forward with this new Congress. Hopefully we'll see here in the next uh, 30, 60 days, some type of a COVID relief plan uh, and uh, some legislation here. Another topic, uh, we were asked to put together a uh, continuity of operation plan for the pandemic. Uh, Katie included it in the email and I'm sure Katie is gonna bring us up to date on that. Looks like it's pretty well thought out. So she'll share with that uh, a little bit later at the executive uh, director report. Uh, next topic, uh, in hopes 
for an in-person annual Tug Hill Commission meeting this year. Uh, back in December, we proposed uh, October 21st uh, as that in-person meeting that would be held at the Tailwater Lodge. Uh, due to a conflict at the lodge, we are today proposing that we make a change to the date, and we would like to move it from the 21st, October 21st, to October 14th at the same venue, Tailwater. Do we have any concerns about that? Any questions? If not, I'd like to see a motion to accept that proposed change. I'll move. Do I have a second? I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Anybody abstain? Okay. Thanks. Um, also, I, I, I encourage everyone uh, to tune in by Zoom. Hopefully by Wednesday, I'll have a better internet connection. Um, for a, the first part of a three-part series, and it's going to be Wednesday at 7 p.m., this Wednesday at 7 p.m., and it's going to be uh, 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 presented uh, by our own Commissioner Leona and her son Pete, and it's entitled Letters of a Tug Hill Logger. I know I'm excited. Can't wait to, to see the the, uh, the, uh, um, the meeting, and then... Uh, well, we got uh, Leona on the call here. Maybe if you could just give us a little bit on how this all came to be. Well, I when I was I was a late bloomer, and I I used my grandfather's letters for a writing project, and so that's when I first got really familiar with them. That was in uh, no 1996 or so. And so I've always wanted to do something more with them because it's such, such great stories about what logging and life was like on Tug Hill in the early 1900s. And so that, that, that was something. And I, I'm not sure, I can't quite remember how, how Katie and, and uh, Jennifer I don't remember just what we did, but anyway, they it probably all stemmed from the constable series. So oh. they asked me if we'd be willing to to do a webinar on on my grandfather's letters. Great. Well, I think it's going to be great. It's, it's, uh, I am a kind of a, a history of the of, of uh, the entire Tug Hill historian on the Tug Hill uh, area or region, if you will, and. I'm actually looking at, uh, uh, hopefully when I retire to, in my spare time, to take a look and do a deep dive on the town of Montague, because I think there's so many stories here that, you know, folks that, uh, that are either campers or, or, or even residents that, uh, that they just don't know what those stories are, are about. So I think you're, uh, you're doing a great thing, Leona, on this, uh, on this three uh, uh, series event here. So please, everybody kind of tune in. It's, uh, again, it's on... Uh, the 27th, this Wednesday at 7 p.m. If anyone does not have the link to it, we would be more than happy to send it to you. So thanks so much, Sarah. Uh, Katie, you want to move right into the executive director report? Yes, thank you, Jan. And I will say that um, here in Leona talk about it on North Country Public Radio last week, and then having a sneak peek of some of her script over the weekend, uh, it's, it's really going to be a lot of fun. So I think our registrations were up close to 100 already, and I'm sure with all the publicity, uh, it'll keep uh, going up. So with that, uh, Jan mentioned the continuity of operations plan. You all have a copy of that on your emails. Um, this is very, basically um, the template was handed to us from the governor's office. And I took what we had done back in June when we returned to the office from uh, the original uh, work at home orders and just adapted it for this new uh, required plan. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to spend a lot of time going through it because it really is what we're doing right now, but put into this new template. And also part of this is being required from new legislation that was signed in September. 
We've done uh, a couple, uh, we've done a webinar about this, these emergency preparedness plans that are required of all the local governments. Uh, they all have kind of the same requirement. We, we did it uh, at the end of December and it's on our YouTube channel. Uh, but state agencies are also uh, subject to that new law. So that's, it's, this is, it's all kind of related. Um, so were there any questions? I know you haven't had it for very long, but, and it has not been approved yet. It's working its way, I'm sure, through the second floor's uh, process for attorney review, but I don't expect it to be problematic since it was already basically approved uh, when we went, returned to work in June return to the office in June. Katie, do you know how many municipalities are working on one now? <laughs> I think they're all starting to work on them. Um, it, it, you know, the, the legislation was signed by the governor on Labor Day and we've been kind of beating the drum a little bit in Tug Hill times, but it's, it's, you know, they were all in budget season. So I think they got out of budget season and then started realizing they had this plan to prepare. So when we held that webinar between Christmas and New Year's, we had a really good showing. I want to say we had 40 or so people, um, pretty much 40 individual communities on there. And uh, based on requests that the circuit writers have been getting as well, I think they're all really working on it pretty hard. And then what do they do with it? They have to give it to the state for approval? Angie's, Angie, can you re reply to that? I see you nodding your head. They have to, if they have a union, they have to have it to the union by February 4th for um, the union to be able to comment. And then um, they have to have it filed in their own municipality by April 1st, but it doesn't have to be filed with the state anywhere. Can I ask you a question uh, it, on my email, you know, Katie, we're an authority. Um, it said that it should be, it could be part of the policy manual is, it, does it, because I can't get a definitive answer because uh, we did ours uh, last week, and um, I'm putting it up before the board to be a policy. Uh, mm. Is that amendment to your policy manual is one of the items? I mean, we could consider making it, you know, part of our internal policies. Um, I was really looking at this as something, you know, that was be re being required from the, the governor's office and was and was doing it for, for them, but I, I'm open to us considering well, I, it that way as well. No, my, no I, I wasn't saying we do it. I'm just, I, what your interpretation was because there's difference between the agency and an authority. And I was just wondering if I had a, if you had a more, I should say information for me because I can't really get the definitive answer from anybody, so. Uh, we can look into it. We've been talking to a few different people uh, on this. So I, I'll ask the question and see if I can find anything out. Um, so with that, I, I'll switch to, as Jan mentioned, we are in the governor's proposed budget. We will be monitoring that closely. Um, some other executive budget proposals that you, know, you all might be interested in, in hearing about. And of course, this is all subject to change in the final budget, but it does appear that there's another round of Regional Economic Development Council grants proposed to be funded. Remember, those were, were not done this past summer. They normally would have been due at the end of July, and that did not happen. Um, another round of downtown revitalization is proposed. The Army Compatible Use Buffer Program that we have helped uh, secure funding for for the land trust is in the proposed Environmental Protection Fund budget. AIM related payments have been are scheduled are proposed to be reduced by 20%. There's a lot of detail around that. Um, Association of Towns has a very good summary on their website for any towns that might be interested in understanding that better. Good news, CHIPS, Pave New York, and Bridge New York are all funded in the proposed budget. As Jan mentioned, uh, oh, yeah, shaking his head. I'm sorry, Pave New York was not included in the budget? It was. Pave New York and Bridge New York are included in the proposed. Emergency, uh, emergency winter recovery. Yes, you're right. Extreme winter recovery was not. Thank you. Which is a problem, I know. <laughs> Thank you for pointing that out. And I'm sure your uh, Association of Towns and Town and County Highway Superintendents Associations will be lobbying to get that in. Uh, Legalizing the uh, adult use of uh, recreational cannabis is proposed. 
from the Association of Towns summary, there is no direct revenue available for towns or a local opt-in or opt-out on that proposal. There is some language around extending the real property tax exemption for renewable energy projects and equipment through 2030. Towns that provide tax exemptions must use the standardized exemption value set forth in the law and assessors and towns that opt out of the exemption must assess property in accordance with valuation methods set forward in the law. Towns that provide the tax exemption still retain the authority to enter into a pilot agreement. And there is some notification requirements on pilot agreements. And that is in part X of the revenue bill if you wanna read the actual language yourself. The proposed budget would also make permanent the countywide shared services initiative, which uh, some of you may be familiar with. Many counties have uh, submitted these plans. Lewis County submitted their first one this last year with our help. Uh, Jefferson has submitted several times to Swigo and Oneida on and off, I believe. The proposal would also allow projects included in previous countywide shared services plans that have not yet been implemented to be eligible for state matching funds. So that's some detail around the program. It's pretty complicated uh, how these plans work with the money that's reimbursed. Uh, so we'll see how that all pans out. But those are some of the highlights of the executive budget that I thought were worth sharing here today. As Jan also mentioned, uh, some of us have been assisting at state, some of the state vaccination sites. There was a call out to all state agencies to please put forward some staff that could do that. Uh, that is pretty intensive and is on site. It was on site work, so you're in where everyone's coming in to get their vaccines. There's not there's clinical and non clinical positions that they are canvassing for. At this point, uh, we've, we've, we've offered up three people trying to balance the need for the state to you know, have volunteers plus keeping enough staff to get our work done. Uh, and so Angie is trying to become a vaccinator given her um, EMT background. She has went through lots of the training but needs a final uh, assessment of her needle jabbing skills, I suppose, uh, before she can start uh, working at one of the sites. Uh, Elena and I have been working as non-clinical uh, support staff at the Potsdam site, um, which has been an interesting uh, thing to observe. Um, it's, they're put, putting 500 people through Potsdam every day at this point with existing vaccine supplies. Um, we uh, are def uh, Elena has spent time mainly in the recovery area where after people get their shot, they're monitored for at least 15 minutes to make sure they're not going to have any adverse reactions. I primarily worked um, with the pharmacy staff being a, the, the runner of the syringes between them and the vaccination uh, stations. So it goes pretty smoothly as they, they try to get 50 people approximately through in an hour to get to that 500 people per day um, target goal. Uh, as you know, the, it's a five, the Potsdam site has Pfizer and there are six doses for most of the vials for Pfizer. So there's a lot of being careful of uh, making sure you don't make up too many uh, syringes. They only have a certain, certain shelf life once they're mixed. And um, it's been pretty educational, I would say, to be part of that. Uh, it is taking some time though. Uh, there, and, and there will be some costs to us out of our budget. We are tracking those costs as COVID-19 costs. So the state can ask for federal reimbursement for those at the end of the day, uh, but uh, not sure how that will make its way back into our actual budget, but, but given the high priority of this project, we felt that it was you know, a good thing to be part of the solution here uh, statewide. Uh, I see hey, there's a, yep, hey, go ahead. Do you know how far away people are coming? I mean, Potsdam and Plattsburgh were one of the two areas that still had openings. Uh, they've been doing them down at SUNY Poly but a lot of people uh, in central New York 
can't get appointments because they're coming from like way downstate, like Westchester County, et cetera, they're coming up uh, to Utica and Rome. I, I observed most of the people in Potsdam being local, um, St. Lawrence County type folks. However, we did hear of one couple who did travel from Long Island uh, up to Potsdam to get their shots. It's open, you know, it's not when you go onto the state's website and sign up for an appointment, it's, you're not, you're not required to be from that area. You have to be a state res resident, but you don't have to be from that area. So yeah, that is an issue people um, traveling and yeah, well, I, we have signed up and we're in, and it, it is a complicated process. I mean, you couldn't get through registration and you were bumped off, but uh, we're on the last day of February. That was the earliest. And about three days after that, people were making reservations at SUNY Poly the end of April. But it was like you could see the spots filling up as you as you were doing it, but they still have places in Potsdam. I mean, that was my next choice to go there, but the end, the end of February is fine with us, as long as they still have the vaccine. <laughs> yeah, and I, I mean, at the Potsdam site, you could put a lot more than 500 people through that a day if there was enough of the, of the vaccine to do, and I think that's their hope, is once there's more of a supply, they're gonna wanna be pushing double that through there a day. Um, and I see Carla is making a comment in the chat about kinneys. There is the option to sign up for kinneys and they will send alerts to people once they have more vaccine. It's all about supply and demand right now. And there's way more demand than there is supply, unfortunately. I will say that the local drugstores, um, and we deal with kinneys, they've been very good with people that we know about sending them a memo, uh, an email when there were openings available due to somebody's cancellation or whatever. And yeah. my wife was able to get appointments um, through Kenny's quite easily compared right. with the Just state system. Check your county or county websites too, because the counties themselves are getting a little trickle of vaccines. So you might be able to get one in through the, one of the county health departments. Yeah, we've been doing that, but some of the county websites were, ran out of vaccine. Uh, and uh, the state had set up a uh, a center outside of the auditorium, and that was never feasible. Uh, they were going to remodel a building to do it in, rather than use <clears throat> SUNY or MVCC. So there's been a lot of missteps in this area, but we have appointments. So, well, that's good. And yeah, there's a, I've seen a lot of teachers getting them at Potsdam as well as, you know, elderly. I've seen grocery store workers, you know, frontline essential workers. Uh, so it's, it's been heartening, honestly, because people are nervous when they come in, but they're also so thankful. And just, you know, this is kind of like the end of a long tunnel for a lot of people, and especially for some of the pretty frail elderly that we've seen go through there. Um, being helped by their sons or daughters. And um, it's, it's just, it's, it's nice to see, but you know that there's so much more demand. Um, any more questions on that? Uh, switching gears a little bit, uh, Zoom municipal meetings. We just uh, did a count of how many Zoom municipal meetings we helped uh, facilitate in 2020. And uh, it's a 183 Zoom municipal meetings. So this is a board meeting, a planning board meeting, not like little project meetings that we've been doing here and there too. So that's a huge effort um, on, the, on the part of staff to have, have that happening. And we really, I wanna thank everybody. We really think that we've helped hopefully keep local governments running during this process, uh, keep them safe, especially when uh, things got crazy here more recently. Uh, we're gonna have a graphic on that for, for headwaters because we do think that's a pretty important thing to be sharing that uh, we've all done together. And it's been a way for us to keep in touch with those communities, uh, got, gotten to know a lot of people a lot better, uh, seeing them on Zoom, seeing them in their homes, you know, living through this together, it's been, you know, the way you communicated and had uh, interaction with people for, for the last 10, 10 going on 11 months. So 
it's all good. A uh, couple projects uh, updates, minimum maintenance roads. Uh, the, the, the existing bill was reintroduced in the assembly. There is no same as in the Senate at this point. We have been working with uh, various stakeholders on bill edits that we hope will address some of the assembly concerns and uh, reflect some of the results of the appellate decision. Those bill edits were attached to my email this morning. And again, they're still just edits. They are, uh, we're, we're working with Senator Griffo's office to, to massage what he puts forward in his bill to try to get to some place where there can be a compromise. Um, if anyone has any comments on those, I'd be happy to talk either now or offline, but we, we, we've marked it up with some comments on the side of that document so you can kind of see what our thought process was in different parts of that. And a uh, big thank you to Matt and Jean and Angie who have really stepped up and been helping with that quite a bit. Uh, Katie, it was in the Utica paper yesterday, Brian Miller, who is an assemblyman from New Hartford, a suburb of Utica, is now on the Transportation Committee. I don't know if he was previously. Uh, he's been there, I think this is his third term, but um, maybe that's worth knowing. Yeah. He's the vice Chair of the Steering Committee. <laughs> Thank you. I will, I, you know, I have, I don't even think I've looked at the makeup of the Assembly Transportation Committee again this year. I, that's an oversight on my part. So I will, mm -hmm. do you know him at all? I've met him. I don't really know him that well. I do know that he was very sick with COVID last year. He almost died. He was on a vent for like two or three weeks. Okay. And he's not late 50s. That's middle aged. <laughs> Okay, that's very good to know because we will start ha having to work on that side of things again. Broadband, uh, it seems like we start off every meeting talking about our internet connections as we're trying to get onto Zoom. There has been, I, as I've reported at a previous meetings, progress. Lewis County's broadband survey and inventory is probably pretty close to complete. Jefferson County's has just begun and we need to send uh, actually an email out to our Jefferson County folks in our web, in our uh, database, urging them to fill out that broadband survey. Make a note to myself. Um, Oswego County, I know the inventory, the physical inventory is pretty much complete. They are starting their survey uh, part of that. Oneida County, we continue to be in regular discussions with the Mohawk Valley Economic Development District. Uh, Herkimer County, who is also interested in partnering with Oneida County, as well as some potential additional funding sources, National Grid and the Community Foundation of Oneida and Herkimer counties specifically, to pull together that project. About half the money or so is available from the Economic Development District's CARES Act allocation, but there is still um, a, a hump to get over on, on the match. We will be talking to NOCOG about that again uh, early next month as well as a potential source of a small amount of match to, to, to close that project. We've been hearing, well, there was a proposal in the governor's budget about broadband and about making it affordable to a $15 per month price point. Uh, hopefully that means that there'd be more state money coming for some of the costs of it, uh, uh, related to it. And, who knows what's going to happen with federal stimulus and broadband infrastructure, but I have a feeling that there may be money uh, soon to do some implementation so that all this work is to really position our four counties to take advantage of those implementation funds. Headwaters, we're working on it. It should be out next month. Uh, that's our annual report. And um, important to get out, we were uh, statutorily re required to have that out by the end of March. The Snowmobile Economic Impact Study that you all approved the $5,000 for last meeting is starting. Uh, we had a, a kickoff meeting, I think it was last week. They will be on the trail starting the beginning of February to do intercept surveys of snowmobilers. There will also be an online electronic uh, component to the surveying. And I think 
thank God we got snow because we were all worried about not having snow and that impacting the results of the study. But I think that problem has been solved for the <laughs> for the time being. And I don't see any warm ups uh, immediately in sight. So that's good. Renewable energy projects. Uh, the one that's been uh, taking up a lot of time more recently is the Watertown Greens Corners project that Tom's very familiar with. Uh, Matt and Elena are quite involved in that. And there's been some press on that recently. That's it's a bit, becoming a bit controversial with uh, landowners group um, in opposition. Of course, this project is an Article 10 project that's going to be transitioning to 94C. The town is trying to get their zoning in order uh, and it's a good uh, it's a good learning experience for us, and hopefully we'll have some lessons learned for other communities. Tom, did you want to make any comments or Matt? Well, I need to thank Matt and Elena. It's been quite a burdensome journey for us and especially for them, and we really appreciate their help. Um, there's so much controversy on both sides. You know, we've met with landowners that are in favor, uh, farmers that are opposed, farmers that are in favor. Uh, you know, of course, nobody wants this in their backyard. We came up with what we thought was a pretty reasonable proposal. Um, you want something reasonable so that when the siting committee reviews um, a proposal for one of these big projects, they'll actually consider what the locals have. Right now, the status is um, the town board opened a public hearing uh, earlier this month and they had very, very abundant comments from the public. They kept the public hearing open. Uh, the town planning board has rediscussed this with uh, the developer Borlax, and we've got some changes that we wanna make, and uh, it's just an ongoing process. Um, yeah, I, I'd add, it's, it's just, this is a great learning process for us. Um, and especially Elena, who has been kind of thrown into this as a relatively new mm -hmm. planner, uh, but she's handling it very well. Um, we're trying to be the, trying to make everybody happy, which doesn't always work, but we're doing our best. And I will say, um, we were already planning to do an update to our issue paper that's for planning for offsite solar energy projects, but this this project has helped inform <laughs> the, the edits to that paper and that, those should be out within the next week or two. Um, we have it out for a review by uh, several colleagues and have just finished getting their comments. So that will be out soon. Uh, training, we have a lot of uh, webinars coming up. Uh, you have a handout for January and February. Uh, Jan highlighted the letters from a Tug Hill logger, which is, it might be the most popular one, the most fun one, if you will, but we do have a lot of other um, informational webinars coming up. We have scheduled these really because without the local government conference, we felt like we needed to be offering some opportunities for our communities and, and different aspects of uh, local government. So you'll see we have everything from the new records retention schedule to um, some culvert information to cybersecurity, uh, conservation, farmland conservation. We'll have a few more coming in March, but I would uh, suggest, you know, webinars are not great for everybody, they, uh, but that's really all we can offer right now. And I will remind that we record these all and put them on our YouTube channel for, for future. And we, we've been pushing people to that quite a bit um, it is it is a good resource. And then finally, our 488 issue paper that you've seen a few times, it has been finalized. We announced that in the last Tug Hill Times. Uh, we have sent that off to some of our partners and actually we, we need to do um, a press release on that. I'll make a note to myself on that as well. That was a lot of effort. Um, that was um, Jen and Angie uh, for the most part putting that together, uh, we'll see what comes of it. I know there's still a lot of conversation around the Climate Action Council and the advisory panels about forestry and its role in carbon sequestration and 488 amendments are one of the big topics being discussed. 
And so we're hoping our paper can help inform that and make sure whatever is done, they got to keep in mind those municipal budgets and the impacts the locals feel when a program like that has a big uh, increase in subscription, basically. Any questions for me? Thanks, Jen, I'm done. Okay, good, thanks. Now, unfortunately, I can't see anybody. So Katie, you might uh, want to help here, but we'll move right into the Council of Government reports. You can do it any order you want. Why don't you take sure. it? Um, Paul, you want to go first? Got to unmute yourself. <laughs> there you go. Can everybody hear me? Yep. All right. Very good. Happy to see you all. Um, well, we're into the uh, the new year, and as uh, usual with the new year, everybody's doing their organizational materials, getting ready to get going for the year. Uh, looking forward to seeing what happens with the uh, state budget and uh, working on those public employer healthy emergency plans that uh, didn't get a lot of attention, as Katie noted, through the uh, election and uh, budget development season when they're working on town budgets uh, last fall. And then of course, we barely got done with the uh, town budgets and we're into the, the holiday season and people are busy. And uh, I have to say that uh, the supervisors and mayors, I don't think have been getting a lot of uh, engagement from their board members yet, although they've solicited it yet. I got that comment from a supervisor just today that they put it out to the uh, town board that they'd be happy to have everybody uh, possible involved in collaborating on that, but they're not seeing a lot of engagement. So they're gonna take the lead as they must as a supervisor or mayor and uh, move things forward. And I'll be working with uh, some of those. And uh, of course, this time of year is the time of year that villages are starting to get going with their uh, village budgets for the upcoming fiscal year. So it's a uh, never ending cycle between towns, villages and the states and budgets. It's always somebody working on something it seems. Uh, the end of the year was kind of interesting for the towns because uh, it was, there didn't seem to be a consistent pattern with municipalities and what they wound up realizing with their revenues and expenses compared to what they had figured on when they worked on initiating it over a year ago when they adopted their 2020 budgets. Uh, some revenue sources held the same, some came in better and some came in worse, but I, didn't, I can't say that I saw a consistent pattern across the uh, board on that. And then of course, uh, everybody had additional expenses associated with uh, COVID and supplies and uh, changes in their uh, practices, but they also wound up saving some money because there were things that they were used to doing like summer recreation programs and so on that uh, went by the wayside in response to COVID. So uh, I'm not sure the picture is entirely clear as to what the uh, impact was that, that COVID had on municipalities and their municipal budgets in uh, 2020. Uh, everybody's looking forward to seeing uh, more vaccine out there and hopefully uh, being able to loosen things up. But at this point, toward the end of 2020, the municipalities were generally tightening things up and have been in January where they've gone, they had open meetings back up, but some more than one municipality have closed down their municipal uh, buildings for public uh, contact, which means when they're conducting their town board meetings, they are sometimes the town board members themselves are getting together at the municipal building, but the building is close to the public and they're extending public contact to that via Zoom. So uh, that's increased the demand on us for uh, supporting municipalities uh, with Zoom. Another change that we've seen in, in 2020 that uh, we saw a little bit of last year, but it didn't really hit quite as much until this year and that's uh, towns and tax collection. Now things really swung up in terms of tightening things down 
with COVID, as you recall, I, I believe it was March 18th that things really started cranking down. And by that point, a lot of the, uh, the tax collection has already taken place. Uh, this year, of course, uh, we're heavily into uh, COVID and COVID uh, prevention procedures. And uh, my, uh, the town clerks in my area have largely gone, and tax collectors where there are separate tax collectors, have largely gone by saying, well, we'll meet with you individually to take your taxes if you insist, but we would really prefer you don't do things in cash uh, to avoid that kind of handling of materials. And uh, several of my municipalities have installed uh, slots on their building where they will accept payments through a slot, or of course they could always do it by mail, uh, but they've also installed uh, physical slots on their municipal buildings to accept tax payments if people wanted to drop them off directly rather than mail them. But there, there have been changes in uh, tax collection procedures this year that municipalities were able to implement more fully because of course we could see back in October and November and December that this didn't show any signs of abating real soon and we wanted to conduct everything in as safe a manner as is possible. So it has changed the uh, climate of the tax collection season this year. Plus municipalities, uh, the, the town clerks are generally, uh, they seem to be conducting a lot of their business. Again, if it has to be in public, they're doing it by uh, appointment rather than just having an open office with uh, open hours. So uh, COVID continues to impact the uh, operation of municipalities and has continued to affect uh, the type of uh, demand it's put on Tug Hill staff to respond to municipal needs. Thanks, Paul. Uh, Angie? Good morning. Um, similar to Paul in my area, tax collection has, has changed for a lot of people. Uh, a lot of the buildings have gone uh, appointment only, as Paul said. Um, uh, my meetings have been a mishmash. Uh, I have a lot of municipalities and <laughs> so uh, a lot of them have gone Zoom and many have gone hybrid and I do have a few that are still meeting in person if they have a big enough hall <clears throat> where they can safely social distance. But we've got we've got we've had an interesting mix. Let's just say, <laughs> um, specifically in my cog, we do, we have gotten some interest from the village of Adams of joining the council of governments. Um, I have reached out to their mayor. I haven't heard back specifically from them yet. So as I've told Paul and Mickey many times, that's the last one that possibly could be mine. Anyone else unaffiliated is one of theirs. So uh, if the town of our village of Adams does join that, I'll put uh, the CTHC at 22 municipalities. Um, specifically what's going on in my towns, we have several towns that are, we're working to get the mini comp plans that we had an intern do a couple years ago adopted. Uh, also, we are going back to our towns and uh, most of our my towns have done their official roadmap. We've gone back to make sure that any updates have been done on those and that they're filed correctly because some of them weren't filed with the county appropriately the first time. So both of those regional products projects we're working on, Elena's been helping me out quite a bit with those and Matt. Um, we do have um, uh, Osceola has just started back through the minimum maintenance road process again. Um, they started a few years ago and then stalled. Um, so they're circling back and starting over. So we've been talking to them about adopting a minimum maintenance road law. Um, we have a, a few towns that are working on zoning amendments or I'm hoping will. Uh, Norm is here with us today from the town of Worth. Um, that, that we've had a couple discussions. We're hoping that maybe Worth will look at their zoning. It's been a long, long time since that's been looked at. So we've all got our fingers crossed for Worth. <laughs> um, Lewis County uh, is working to, for, to countywide become a climate smart county or a clean energy communities, county, whatever. So some of their towns and villages are <laughs> working to start that process. Um, and there is some hope in Lewis County that uh, there may be another LED street lighting aggregate started. So I've been reaching out to my Lewis County towns and some of my bordering as we go in uh, Jefferson County towns to see if any of them are interested in updating their LED street lights. If we can get another group like Mickey's original group started. So um, I think that's all that was on my list. That's all I can think of in any case. Unless you have any questions. 
So, uh, Jean, do you want to go next? Yep, I'm here. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, <clears throat> Oh, I think I can echo everyone, both Paul and Angie's sentiments on the Zooming. Um, December, in December, um, the county executive um, encouraged all communities to go uh, virtual, left everyone in a little bit of a scramble. Um, most communities are um, Zooming or virtual or a hybrid of it. Um, I have the commission uh, between a bunch of staff. Um, I have set up five uh, Zoom meetings out of the 17 NOCOC communities uh, that are for, for Zoom meetings. Um, two of them also include their planning boards and ZBA. So it's a, it's a lot of Zooming. <laughs> um, and I appreciate all the staff helping cover these meetings. Uh, Carl is covering, covering Remsen, Matt and Elaine are covering the planning board and ZBA meetings. <clears throat> um, everyone is really pitching in. Um, the, uh, the executive, NOCOG executive board had a meeting in December and they will have another meeting February 4th. Um, we have a new uh, new executive board member that we need to get him properly installed on the board. I think that will include a virtual election, <laughs> so I have to I have to work on that. Um, we are have a full contingent of contract circuit writers. We have three <clears throat> contract circuit writers covering all seventeen communities, and that is. That's a lot of um, a lot of pressure off of, off off of staff, either covering Zoom or going down to those no cog meetings. So um, we have John Hilt, who's been with no cog for some time. Some time, Lisa Bellinger from Boonville, who has been with us since October, and a new contract circuit writer uh, Joe Rollins, who. <clears throat> Um, I don't want to say replaced Harlan, but is is covering the, the meetings that Harlan covered. <coughs> um, both Lisa and Joe are new, so there's a bit of a learning curve there. Um, we're trying to get a, um, we, we had a circuit rider meeting last Friday and we talked a little bit about doing a meet and greet with staff and of the, the new associate circuit riders at some point because these new associates just haven't met the staff and don't know what everyone does. And I think that will be a, a, a nice thing to do, a meet and greet with the, the new so associates and the staff. Um, let's see. The only other thing that I, um, want to mention is um, we're still working on the the GPS um, projects and hoping this spring that Mark Clark um, is going to be able to pick up some more projects uh, with that for NOCOG. Um, we do have him lined up to do that work. I think that'll be a good addition to um, the projects for NOCOG. That's all I have. Thanks, Jean. Uh, Mickey, it looks like you've made it home or you're in transit. I know you were just here picking up a computer, so. Here and now. Can um, hear you? Oh, can you hear me okay? It's okay. Can you hear me okay? It's kind of. Hello? Uh, <laughs> how about now? Can you hear me okay right now or? It's not too bad. Yep, go ahead. Okay. Um, hang on, let me just kick it off here. I'm just pulling in. So let me kick it off from Bluetooth here. Okay, can you hear me all right? Yeah, that's better. Thank you. Okay. Um, so 
right now, uh, I guess the biggest news for RACOG would be that the Village of Laval has joined RACOG. So we now have the Village of Laval. And we've been, uh, basically RACOG has been focused on, um, our last meeting was on the emergency management plans for the pandemic planning that the governor was requiring communities to do for April 1st. Uh, so we actually had Jefferson County Emergency Management and Lewis County Emergency Management um, on that on that board meeting and presented to the group, which a lot of the group said, well, you know, we already kind of got ours done. So it, they didn't know if it really helped them a lot. But after listening to them speak, they said, well, I think we need to go back and change some things in our plans. So um, so it wound up being a pretty good meeting. Um, we'll probably, I'll be trying to take that uh, video from that from our RACOG board meeting and, and cut that and put it on YouTube. And uh, so that way, you know, other communities can look at that if they wanted to. And then uh, the other thing is LED lighting that continues to kind of just move forward. It's been actually kind of quiet, which has kind of been nice because it's all kind of in the hands of National Grid and these agreements that the communities have sent back to them, signed. So just waiting for. National Grid sign off. So, so and of the, of the group, there was only two communities that did not move forward with NIPA, and uh, Champion and Casterland decided to switch with uh, National Grid. They're still doing the LED conversion, but through National Grid. So, um, all the other ones are moving forward. And then, um, uh, we we do have so. Kind of related to Ray Cog and Tuggill, I guess, is that it looks like we have a Fort Fort Drum intern going to come on on March 15th, um, starting then, who's interested in urban planning and uh, project management, and will be available until May 15th, so two months. Um, our next uh, Ray Cog board meeting, we've been we actually uh, kind of been looking at the railroad bed in that situation too. Our next Ray Cog board meeting, we're going to be lining up. Um, Christopher Reef from New York State DOT. He's with the Watertown Jefferson County Transportation Council. And they're the ones that kind of been working on the Black River Trail that's gonna go out to Fort Drum from Watertown. Um, the group wants to see if there's any way to get that trail extended down into Carthage too, going from Fort Drum down to Carthage, which then would tie in a little bit with the railroad bed from Carthage to Lowellville. So uh, that's the next presenter we're hoping to have uh, lined up and Oh, and that just the, like everybody else has mentioned, Zoom meetings. I think I calculated 91 that were somehow tied to RACOG member communities or, or RACOG um, that we've done since April, April to the December. Um, and same thing, most of them are meeting remotely. Some are doing hybrids, so remote and in person. So that's been moving along and I guess that's, that's about all I guess I got there other than continue to work on some website stuff uh, with Town of Wilna's now switching their website over to RACOG. So I've been working on some of that. Um, also, Matt and Elena have been working on the level comp plan. Um, and that continues and we start in the SWAT exercises here soon. So I guess that's all I got unless there's any questions. One thing I forgot to mention when I was speaking is we are tentatively planning a COG leaders meeting. We do this every year where we try to get the chair of each of the COGs together and with uh, the directors and the circuit riders just to see how things are going and give an update on the commission and hear, hear directly from the COG leaders. And we are gonna do that via Zoom. <laughs> no, no good food like we normally have and fellowship around a table. And last year was in Redfield. It was right before all of the crap hit the fan here. Um, so we're gonna try to do that on February 23rd uh, via Zoom. And we, we're, we haven't gotten that out to the COG leaders yet, but Jan, I need to check with you too and see if that would work for you. It'll, we haven't decided on a time. Yep. We typically do those in the evening. Yep, okay. just let me know, we'll make myself available. Good. Okay. And then the other do thing I, I forgot, to, one other thing I forgot to mention, I'm so sorry. Um, I sent out uh, the, the community recognition program description that we had put together last year that we put on hold because of COVID and the lack of an annual meeting. Um, I'm, I think we should 
do that again, you know, try to do that this year with the hopes of an in-person annual meeting in October. So I, I think the timing would be to be uh, getting that out to communities and asking for uh, nominations. I forget if it was April 1st or June 1st, but sometime in the spring, I think we had a due date of September 1st for, for any nominations. So we would have the commissioners and the, the COG leaders would have time to make a decision um, and, and approve that before an annual meeting. And with our annual meeting in October, October 14th this year, that we might need to shift that time frame up a little bit. I haven't thought through that, but um, just wanted to reconfirm that everyone was on board with that. I see some head nodding. <laughs> Which Jan can't see, but I'll take that as a yes. Yes. <laughs> okay. Also, Katie, it seems like I hate to even say this, there aren't too many sages that are still alive. <laughs> it seems like, you know, a lot of them are older people, but we have lost quite a few in the last uh, two or three years. What is the <clears throat> How often do you do the stages? Like every three or four years? It's been a while. It's been since before I became executive director that we um, have done any, I want to say 2013. <coughs> I was thinking 15. Fif maybe 15. But I came, I became executive director in like 16. So I don't know. It's all a blur, but it's been quite a while. And, oh. um, and this is Mickey actually since you brought that up. Um, there was uh, the clerk for Carthage. She had brought up asking about the Tug Hill Sages and whether Tug Hill Commission is going to be doing that again because she wanted to actually nominate uh, Wayne McElroy, uh, who's the chairman of Ray Cog and also the mayor for Carthage. And he has a camp up in Osceola. And so she was just wondering about that because she um, thought he'd make a good Tug Hill Sage candidate. But. Yeah, the uh, last Tug Hill Sages I remember was uh, when we did our ceremony up in uh, Adams and John Bartow was uh, still uh, executive director. That was quite a while. That was a class that, well, we brought in some of our, yeah, our, our newest uh, Sages. That was, that was 2015. Yeah. Yep. Well, just something to think about. Yeah. Yep, that's really been, um, you know, the commission board has decided they when they when they're ready and and, and to move forward with that. So, yeah, I know there's yeah. been discussion of the potential of doing uh, posthumous uh, uh, awards of uh, Tug Hill Sages, but it's really nicer to award it to them when they can still appreciate it. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, one name that just came to mind was Janet Burgoyce from Boondah, who passed away in November, who. Uh, Actually, it's her family that started uh, all the Burgoyne's business, 3B Timber, uh, Burgoyne's Auto Sports, all that. And she had also served as the executive director for the New York State Timber Producers for a while. Uh, I know her um, obituary in the boom world was huge, <laughs> the things that she had done. But if you, if you talk to anybody, that in family, she was a driving force between all the, all those messes. She was the one that kept Stu her son is alive, pretty elderly, and the sons. Uh, she did planning really kept things moving along. So, what was her name, Jerry? Janet Burgoys. Uh, like Mark Burgoys would be her son. Um, I can't remember what the other son's name is. But she died in around Thanksgiving, but the obituary was in the paper till like mid-December, it was in the Boonville Herald. There was also George Catago that passed. Oh yeah, just, just recently, yeah. Uh... He, he would be a great candidate. So Katie, what's the next step for the uh, recognition program? Um, I think it's basically when the time when the time is right, 
distributing that nomination, the description and the nomination form to our communities, our COGS, you know, just throw it out there and probably at Tug Hill Times and, and have the circuit riders share it and start getting some nominations. So you really think that the best way to uh, uh, roll this program out is just have the circuit riders uh, discuss it at their Zoom meetings and hopefully as we get closer to normality to uh, we're having face-to-face -face meetings again is to, to roll it out to, to, to the uh, municipalities. Yeah, I mean, we could, I suppose, do a press release on it. Um, that would, you know, get it out to a broader, broader audience too. Yeah. Okay. So our goal would be to have something in place um, uh, by our uh, our annual meeting in October. Yeah, that was what I was thinking. Is we would be awarding it in October. Okay. We, okay, good. We would want to post it on the website and in the Tug Hill Times. Yep. And uh, whenever the <clears throat> the other paper, what is it? Greenings? No, that's. Uh, Greenings is titled Tomorrow Headwaters. Um, yes, Headwaters. Yep. Yeah, we could think about putting something in there that this is uh, something we're going to be doing in 2021. I, um, I, local newspapers are non existent except over on the east side of the hill. So it's <laughs> more yeah, places we can get it out. It's tough. Okay. Okay. Uh, Katie, you want to roll right into the uh, finance report? Yep. So you all have um, the 20, uh, January 21st um, financial statement in front of you. Uh, again, uh, we're pretty low on a lot of our, our lines to date. Uh, we did add in the item you approved at the last meeting regarding research and analysis, the snowmobile study for $5,000 and, and took out the appropriate amount from our, non, our unallocated. Uh, Felicia was just messaging me that we might want to consider given uh, the travel expenses that we are incurring when Elena and I go to Potsdam, uh, making a, an amendment to the budget to increase our lodging line right now we have a thousand dollars in it no expenses showing to date but i i mean basically state rate is 96 dollars a night and Potsdam to watertown is too far to uh commute especially when you're putting a 12-hour day in in Potsdam. so we might want to consider in, increasing that line i i almost would say who knows how this is going to go for the next you know two and a half months and if if we're too high that's not a big deal we just won't spend it but maybe we should allocate another three thousand dollars to that line which would be and move it from where, move it to move it from where unallocated i mean if you look towards the bottom we had uh uh right Line uh, 54, we have, you know, $58,000 unallocated right now. We need... were being very frugal at the beginning of the year. I think it makes sense. I, I think we're doing I a good a thing. But... Leona, did you make a motion? Yes. Yep. And, and Bill, Bill seconded? Okay. For oh, $3,000 okay. from unallocated to the lodging line? Yeah. yeah. And all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain? So moved. Let's get it. Let's let's appropriate the money. Thank you. Anything else on finance report, Katie? Unless there's any questions, Felicia is on as well. Okay, I guess. Silence means consent. Uh, again, Katie, you're going to have because I can't see anyone. I can't. You're going to have to help me with public comment. Let's just uh, open it up to the floor. If there's any commissioners, anybody, uh, uh, any staff, anybody that has any comments, questions, any queries, please uh, speak up. 
We do have some guests. We have Tim Hunt, the new county highway superintendent in Lewis County. We have Norm yep. Paradise, as I mentioned, from Worth, and Tim Kelly and Amboy, and then several staff. Yes, can you hear me? Hi, Tim. Yep. Hey, how are you, everybody? Uh, town of Amboy, uh, we're wrapping up our uh, comprehensive plan, and a hearing is scheduled the 15th of February, not only to open that up uh, to the public, but we're also changing our zoning law, and because we're including that in with the cap, with the uh, comprehensive plan, we plan on uh, changing our uh, ZBA to go from three members to five members. Now, it's been difficult the last couple of years to even get to three, but uh, what we have decided to do was just basically uh, have two separate entities, the planning board and the ZBA, with the same, uh, basically the same members that are on the planning board and the ZBA. This would give us a little bit more latitude when it comes to absence uh, of any individual or if you have uh, conflict of interest. And we feel this is the best way to go. We rec uh, recommended it to the town board and uh, we had spoken to Paul and uh, Matt concerning this and because it's very difficult to get anybody to uh, serve on any of these boards. We feel this for now, this is the best way for us to go. Uh, there would be different officers in the ZBA and planning and that it would, uh, you know, but they're independent of each other, but it's, I think it's going to solve our problems. So that's what we've been up to. Hopefully we'll have everything wrapped up uh, after March, I believe. But uh, it could be in February. We can do all this too right after the, the regular town board meeting is scheduled right after the public hearing. That's a common problem, uh, having a hard time filling ZBA uh, slots. Yeah, it, it's, it's been a tough road. We, we tried different ways. We talked about getting other people from, uh, from other townships to come in, possibly. But, uh, you know, I, I, well, the experience I've had with the planning board and uh, other municipalities, there's, uh, you know, they either have a zoning law or a land use law, which sometimes varies greatly with the, with the uh, zoning laws and it's hard to get people that are on the same page too. So we feel this is the best way to go. On our planning board, we've been very active for the past five or six years and we've got some very good members and they, they make sure that they get all their training in. And uh, basically uh, the zoning board will be the same except for one person who used to be on the planning board and one person that doesn't wanna be on both boards. So it's, it's working out very well. And uh, we've got room, uh, plenty of room now. One of the, the ZBA board members, he's uh, going to Florida in the winter time now. And so he uh, wants to be an, an alternate in this case. So it'd make it a lot easier. We could still contact him with Zoom meetings. And Paul has been gracious enough to set us up for last month's planning board meeting and uh, this month's also, what we have in a couple of days. But again, I'd like to uh, thank uh, Matt and, uh, and his uh, Elena for uh, helping us very much for uh, completing our uh, comprehensive plan. Thank you guys. Our pleasure. Thank you. That's Anybody it. else? Thank you. Anybody else? I yeah, have to do. Uh, uh, well, Harlan, you go first, you're the guest. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I'd like to say thank you very much to the commission for the very nice card and the very generous uh, retirement gift. Uh, it was certainly a surprise. I didn't expect that, uh, but it was also very much appreciated. And I will do my best to stimulate the economy uh, with that uh, generous gift. So thank you again, all of you very much. Uh, my question hey, was if Oneida County did end up contributing anything to NOCOG this year or not. I do not believe they did. They didn't. Um, no. And uh, they are also been very difficult, honestly, to pin down on this broadband project, even not necessarily with money, 
but with clear support from the county. Um, that might be something we want to talk to you about offline. I've, I've gotten an email as we've been sitting here actually about this. So um, not sure the best way to approach that to really at least get someone um, okay. more engaged. Okay. All right, that was my question. And also the comment Jean had about uh, having the, the circuit riders meet with the staff. I know when I first started as a circuit rider, it was kind of overwhelming to know who did what, you know, and it's changed since there, since that time. Um, and we used to go up as circuit riders maybe once or twice a year for a staff meeting. I know you're doing your staff meetings differently now, but that was helpful to kind of know who was really working on what projects and who to contact. Once you have a name and a face and projects are working on, you're more apt to reach out to them for assistance and for help. Um, I think Carlin would probably agree with me on that. Uh, of course, we were around for a long time, so we knew who was who, but it, in the beginning, it is a little overwhelming. So just my two cents on that. Yeah. Also, Boonville has been hit pretty hard with COVID lately. I know right now there's like 22 people in the nursing home uh, with COVID. The community bank was actually closed. Burger King was closed. Uh, a few other businesses that people go into on a regular basis were closed. The grocery stores and drug stores were still open. Uh, I, I'm not quite sure what it stemmed from. The school did open again last week. Uh, a couple other businesses, um, the lodging kit company uh, had a big outbreak there. Also the Bowers Lumber uh, company that was located in the old Ethan Allen plant has closed down and they're not reopening again. So really permanently. Quite sure what uh, uh, preceded that, why I had heard that early in the fall, but now they're actually getting rid of like office equipment and that type of, of stuff. So uh, it doesn't sound like they are, or, you know, they're going to reopen. So that's a shame. We did hear yeah. from Lisa Kading this morning um, from Boomville. They do have some potential interest in rebuilding in downtown. There's a couple people oh. talking to the to the village about possibilities, and she was pick, wanted to pick our brains about potential funding sources to assist with that. So that's good news, but that's bad news that um, their our lumber is closing. Yeah, it's just closed now. It's closed. Yeah. Yeah, so regarding the uh, meet and greet with the associates, um, it's hard to find a time uh, that works because they're, everybody's doing meetings and a lot of our associates now work day jobs. So it's not something we can easily do during the day or on an evening Monday through Thursday because pretty much everyone's working. So we're thinking we might do a Friday evening bring your own beverage Zoom <laughs> fun meeting. So. If any commissioners want to join in that too, you know, what are we all doing on Friday nights right now? Thank Not you. much. <laughs> I, I told my grandchildren, it doesn't matter. One day's just like another. <laughs> Tim, you're unmuted. I think you're, you're trying to get a word in edgewise. Yeah, that's all right. I just, I had a few things that I thought might be of interest to the folks with the Tug Hill Commission. Um, first of all, the all of the towns in the county here in Lewis County met to come up with a COVID response plan for plowing um, and came up with a plan where they could contact our dispatch center here at the county and we would figure out how many people were down and how we could utilize surrounding towns to accomplish the task. Um, we have had to use it. Uh, the town of Copenhagen was down to two guys. Uh, last week. So we have had to implement that. It seems to be working out pretty well. Um, the guys all work together very well, as you know. Um, on the budgeting front, um, 
I wanted to mention that I am a circuit rider for Cornell Local Roads and I teach a class for budgeting for town highway superintendents. Um, we go over equipment replacement plans, asset management plans, um, all sorts of capital planning. And if anybody needs any assistance in that area, I'd be glad to you know, come out and meet with a town highway superintendent or, or do some stuff there. We go over communicating with your town board, um, you know, making your case on signs and culverts and, and how you actually justify those expenses. Um, I also wanted to mention on minimum maintenance roads that um, for many years I served as the legislative chair for the town highway superintendents association. And that subject has come up many, many, many times. Um, we could not get consensus with the Town Highway Superintendents Association. Um, and I do have some ideas on how you may be able to advance that. I understand how important it is in this region. Unfortunately, I don't think outside of this region, other people understand some of the issues around it. Um, and then lastly, I just wanted to mention Advocacy Day, um, CHIPS money, as we all know, is so important to every single town's budget. It's probably one of the biggest aid areas of the state. Um, the County Highway Superintendents Association right now is looking into it in the governor's budget. Um, he does say that 15% of what was withheld this year will be coming forth next year. They're being silent as to whether that includes chips. And we're kind of pushing right now to, to, to get that to roll over so last year's um, amount that was withheld, if we can get 15% of that to roll over into next year's budget, that would be a, a huge win. So we're working on that. Um, we're obviously working on the extreme winter recovery, uh, getting the legislator to add that back in to make the towns whole. And we're asking for some increases. Um, we're setting up meetings right now. It's a little challenging because it's all on Zoom. Um, many of the towns don't have that capability, so we're trying to figure out how to do little meetings and invite them into Zoom so that we can meet with our legislators. And obviously town um, supervisors are, and board members are always welcome to participate in that stuff. The more the merrier uh, when we're making our case for that funding. So that's all I had. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody no. else? I want to just comment back to Tim. Um, we have been in communication with Bruce at County Highway Superintendents Association and sent him the current bill edits. Um, but I will forward that on to you too, just because you've had a long history and now you're you were in a town and now you're in a county, and so you kind yep. of have a dual perspective. Thank you. Yep. And I don't know about the county association, but the town association has never supported that bill. I actually think they did last year. Uh, they, they took a position of no comment. No comment? Oh, really? Yeah, I was. We had a letter of memo and support. I'll have to check. Uh, I think it, one year they did, and it was kind of lukewarm. They didn't really get behind it. I was on the committee when it was debated heavily. Um, there were many downstate highway superintendents that were opposed to it, hmm. uh, that don't, they just don't understand. Um, or they have camps up here and, and they don't want to, you know, want to get to them. Right. So, um, you know, it's, it's kind of a, as you know, a tricky thing to navigate through. And, yeah. Uh, Megan it, has been very good to work with and she's been very helpful. Yeah. So, okay. Yeah. Thank you. And that's great that you guys have been so proactive with your towns on the COVID response plan. Um, I, I think other counties have been trying to do that. I'm not sure if they've been as uh, successful in actually implementing it. And it sounds like you've already had to use it. So that's good. Yeah. yeah. I think the thing that once you start trying to map out plow routes and really get into the grit, the nitty gritty, you're going to lose your towns. It's better to just have a central communication point where when they run into problems, they can reach out to all the neighboring towns. As long as there's shared services agreements, we can help each other and, and they will. Um, but when you start trying to give them the maps, that's when they start, things start falling apart. We don't know what it's going to look like. It could be one plow route. It could be two towns all at once, right? It's, this thing is evolving so quickly. So it, the main thing is getting them to agree to help each other and then having a central point of communication so that we can do it. Thank you. Anybody else? Katie, do you have anything else? 
No, thank, I don't think so. Thank you. Okay, great. Uh, God willing, our next meeting will be a, a Zoom meeting on March 15th. And uh, with a little luck, I will be back online again with broadband. Um, with that, that's all I have. I guess I need a motion to adjourn. I'll move. I'll, I'll second. <laughs> Leona. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Thanks so much for attending today. And uh, we'll, uh, we'll talk again. Thanks. Thanks, Katie. Thank you. Thank Good you all day, so long and have a happy new year, everybody. Stay safe. You too, Tom. Take care, everyone. Bye, everybody. Bye. -bye. Yep, bye.